first to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Fleischer. Um, you've heard a bit about uh, what uh, this initiative has done. You've heard about what um, people from the NGO community and from uh, the university think about uh, our results. What do you, as a uh, practical international lawyer, or somebody who knows the problems of ensuring cybersecurity in practice, think about what we've done, think about the challenges ahead for this field? There we go. Thank you very much. Is it on? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, first of all, please do not report me, because as a German diplomat, I'm supposed to uh, promote the use of German language in internet, <laughs> and I just suggested that we speak English. Yes, um, I'm, I'm really here as a learner, and I must say I'm an impressed learner. Uh, this, these are very, very exciting questions, and uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you have given all the answers, uh, but you have asked the right questions, and that's that's a very important uh, first step. I I would like to pick up uh, uh, one question that you, uh, Rick, uh, uh, quoted. You said, uh, yeah. "How can we grasp the internet conceptually and uh, legally, and how can we regulate something we don't agree upon?" And and from derived from this, the question uh, is the level of of state intervention. I mean, this question, which poses itself at home, where should the government, the authorities interfere, or should they not? Where should they not? The same question uh, poses itself on, on the international level. In how far sh should uh, international organizations, uh, in how far should state-to-state uh, -state negotiations, contacts, uh, interfere into the internet? And that's a question that we are, we are also in a finding phase. We, when I say we, but this concerns most governments because the the term cyber außenpolitik or cyber diplomacy or international cyber policy is still in, in the making. There is a general feeling amongst uh, governments that we cannot just uh, continue as if the internet didn't exist. I mean, it's, it's, I'm stating the obvious if I say that the, that the internet has become an essential resource, an essential resource like, like energy, like information, like transport. For, for economic, uh, governmental, and, and, and private uh, uh, communication, and that we need to make our, we governments need to make our contribution uh, to, to safeguard this, the, this essential resource. And of course, <coughs> it's not just about security. There's always security, human rights slash uh, 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 freedoms, and there is of course the the third dimension is the economic and uh, development uh, dimension of of the internet, and um, I I think it's late. I don't have much time, and I'm not going to give you a, a lecture. I can just just briefly say that uh, we, of course, feel feel the need to to implement the the human rights, freedom of expression f and access to information, mainly amongst others, as, as, as a guiding principle, as you have said it. Uh, the G8 uh, declaration in Deauville last year uh, was mentioned. I can say uh, proudly that Germany contributed some uh, essential language uh, to this contribution. And it's a very balanced contribution. It's very important that states agreed on this, on having a balance of, of security, freedom and, and economic development. And maybe I stop here. Um, maybe l one one more last uh, point. It's it's not easy. It's not easy to regulate something we don't agree upon. There are different concepts of uh, of different states or groups of state. We have an international discussion. Everybody agrees that we need more security, um, but it is not so easy for us for the for democratic countries to argue that a free internet provides the highest level of security, even if, is, if this is so. Uh, some other states who say, well, the, of course the internet must be more secure, so let's have more state control, it, then it will be safer and secure, is not so easy to, to, to contradict. That just give you a little highlight on, on, on discussions which are going on be between diplomats, both bilaterally and in international fora. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Fleischer. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kleinwächter, is it really not so difficult to contradict the statement that 
more state involvement on the internet means more security? Uh, just, uh, I think uh, the, um, all the issues on the internet are very complex because the internet doesn't exist. It's a network of networks on various layers with no central authority, many, many players. And in so far, you cannot compare this with traditional issues which had a focal point or which has just a limited number of players and a very specific area of activity. As Ricke has pointed out, you know, it's culture, it's media, it's a public space, it's infrastructure. You have not uh, included all the security dimension which Mr. Fleischer has uh, uh, invented. So it's our world. The internet is not that we say we have here the real life and then we have some virtual world. You know, after 15 years now, the virtual world has arrived in our real world. And if we talk about the internet, so we are talking about virtual aspects or dimensions in our real world. So it's not a separated world which can be separated. And in so far also to have the illusion that you could have a, a separate cybersecurity treaty that governments agree on the security you know, is, is an error. So that means uh, uh, you have to look very specifically in what you want to regulate if you come to an intergovernmental uh, treaty. And here another problem arrives. While probably Governments were in control of a lot of issues uh, after World War II if it came to security. With the internet which penetrates you know, not only national borders but a lot of areas that you have dual use technologies, you know, things which are you know, very difficult to define precisely what is public, what is private, what belongs to the authority of a state, what is an issue for a company and so on. Probably the whole system of intergovernmental treaties has reached a certain limit and I personally see this today more embedded in a multi-stakeholder environment where we have governments as a key player, but also it's not only band in town anymore. So there are other players which play a big role from the private sector, uh, from civil society and also the technical community. And if it comes to certain duties or uh, duty bureau, as Ricke has said, we have to look also beyond, uh, let's say, the traditional guarantors, uh, and this was the government for certain rights. And I think if it comes to rights and duties, we have to speak also about rights and duties, in particular duties of corporations, of civil society organizations, and we have to have an agreement on a number of principles among these various stakeholders. It's not enough that governments agree and then tell the private sector and the civil society and technical community you have to accept these principles. Because for a private corporation, it's easy to make jurisdiction shopping, to go to a country with a very low level of, uh, you know, human rights protection, for instance, so they are operating under this national law, but they affect the whole globe because the server does not know the, 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 the uh, national borders. And in so far, the, the approach, which is also in your coalition in the Internet Governance or Forum, uh, in the Internet Governance Forum, to go towards something like a framework of commitments for uh, Internet con world constitution, which would include not only governments but also the other stakeholders is an interesting idea. Uh, in your initiative you mentioned this morning, the Human Rights Declaration is a universal document from 1948 and it should be strengthened. But on the other hand, we have no such document for the Internet. It would be good to have something like the United Nations Charter or the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the Internet, which would give us a general framework. So, but this framework should not be negotiated by governments alone, with respect for the G8, it's a good input, but it's only, you know, one element. But we have to have the other players on board and they have to take also commitments. So I cannot agree, for instance, that just Facebook, you know, uh, one guy wakes up in the morning and changes some rules and 700 million people have to follow. Uh, so th th this is um, not a multi-stakeholder, open, transparent uh, policy development process. So it's a private corporation, okay, but they have also a certain social responsibility for the 700 million people which bring it, which spending time of their real life in this virtual place. Thank you. They do say that the last time a Mark had such a power, it was when his friend was Jesus. You know? <laughs> um, Rike, uh, perhaps over to you. 
Um, you edited a book a couple of years ago on human rights uh, in the global information society. Mm. Uh, would you agree that what we need now is a new declaration on human rights on the internet? No, actually I wouldn't, um, because like, like you said earlier, Wolfgang, um, the internet, the, the, the virtual realm is, is part of, I mean, the two things are completely combined, so I wouldn't start developing something new. Um, I think the, the level of ab abstraction of the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights are, are such that it could easily um, and, and, and is being used. Uh, I, I'm still not convinced that we, ne that, we, uh, that we need new standards. I mean, when I see the way that, that one UN Special Rapporteur has elaborated on just one right um, within this sphere, um, I mean, Im, I mean that could be done across the whole spectrum of rights, uh, and then I'm not sure that we would be missing anything really. Um, okay. I haven't found the convincing argument yet. It would also, I mean, imagine the whole di diplomatic exercise that would also be involved in in developing such a new charter. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the resources that would be spent on on that. And you would have those poor diplomats going to those nasty places, you know, Nice <laughs> and Santiago and, and Baku. Well, okay, Baku probably. Um, <laughs> there's a question from the audience. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, before, uh, I think we have mm -hmm. to go to the audience. Uh, I, uh, one we want to go to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But one sentence only to this discussion. Mm -hmm. what, do we need new international law? Do we need international conventions on the uh, internet? Or is it just... Uh, are the existing ones good enough? And I would say yes, but I would say that yes, the existing international law is is totally s sufficient, not only the human rights law, but also, for example, uh, the UN Charter, uh, the banning of the use of force, and mm. so on, and so on, unless in self-defense, and other very important international humanitarian law. Mm -hmm. But states have to agree on the applicability. States have to, that's the first steps. Uh, States must come together and not try to negotiate everything from the start. We would be sitting day and night in windowless negotiation rooms. <laughs> but uh, states will have to agree that these principles apply in cyberspace and then perhaps uh, agree on some additional confidence building measures uh, between mm -hmm. states. That's the current state of our finding, but we are still mm -hmm. in the process mm -hmm. of building our own opinion on this issue. Thank you. Of course, they could also agree via practice. Uh, they wouldn't need a uh, convention on that. Uh, Mr. Berwald. Um, first of all, sh shall I introduce myself, or sure. is it just okay? Yes, please. Um, uh, the name is Frank Frank Bayesdorf. I'm um, in, uh, working in the collaboratory and uh, ha HU University graduate program, <coughs> Krakow. Um, um, first of all, thank you all for your um, thoughts on uh, this really important issue, and I'm really excited, particular about your last discussion you had because. Um, if you look at uh, attempts to regulate um, the cross-border flow of information in the 20th century, then um, everybody um, um, at this time uh, would have a rather grim outlook on uh, the possibility of coming up with uh, a new international treaty on this sort of thing. So this would sort of confirm what you had been saying here. But I'm just interested, um, I have basically two questions. One is for uh, Ricke. I was interested, um, quite intrigued by your, um, maybe I should stand up because I'm... I'm it's fine. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't really see you that well here. <coughs> She's still here, promise. All right. Um, um, you've been talking about um, the uh, private sector players within this and that they made their own, that they're going to come up with their own laws. And I would be just curious wh whether you could elaborate on that. And then I have a second question for um, Wolfgang. I was just, um, this is probably a children's question. So, so, um, <laughs> but I just would like to throw that you, I mean, um, if you have this multi-stakeholder approach and I mean, it's quite easy. I, I'm just curious, what kind of legitimacy do all the actors involved have in actually coming up with um, rules and norms, how to govern the internet? I mean, it's quite easy for the state, they are democratically ele elected, and I would be just interested, you know, how the other stakeholders are legitimized. Thank you. 
Okay, first over to Rika. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was referring to um, a Harvard professor called John Ruggie, who has been heading a work for some, you know his work, yeah. So I was referring to the to the guidelines on, um, on human rights and private businesses that was adopted last summer. Um, and then referring to the Global Network Initiative. I think it was the Global Network Initiative. So it's not, it's not a treaty, uh, it's guidelines. It guidelines code of conduct, best practices. Um, but what I've heard, uh, and this is still in a very early phase, but I've heard that within the, within the, the international network of national human rights organizations that my organization is also part of, there is a specific working group uh, focusing on human rights and business. And I know that in, in that space, they've dis they started to discuss whether there should be some sort of optional protocol to these ROGI uh, guidelines or to the, so that uh, states could um, commit to a periodic review um, to, to give it a more binding force. So those, I mean, those are some of the issues that are being discussed now, but still within the sort of conventional follow-up mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Wolfgang. Uh, with this um, legitimacy of the stakeholders in the multi-stakeholder governance process, um, the question here is uh, that um, what is the source of legitimacy? You mentioned already election. That's uh, well recognized. That's uh, the main source for governments. So, but all the other stakeholders have a certain legitimacy. Uh, for instance, uh, private corporations argue you know, we get the legit legitimacy by the acceptance through the market. So that means people are buying our products, using our services, and this gives us a certain legitimacy um, that we, you know, play a certain role. It has to be specified what the specific role is. For the civil society, say, you know, we have the knowledge from the ground. We are, you know, have, uh, you know, understand much better probably than a government in a big country, you know, what are the real needs of the people on the ground, Arthur? We have our legitimacy from our roots. And the technical community is arguing our legitimacy comes from our knowledge. We know how things, <laughs> technically, how they are working. So that means the, uh, you have, a, you know, various sources for legitimacy. And the definition which was accepted in the World Summit where Rika and Janetta and others were involved in 2005, defined internet governance as a collaborative effort by government, civil society, and uh, private sector in their specific roles. I think this is the very important point. Nobody can substitute the government, but the government, as I said, is not anymore the only band in town because without the linkage to the root, without the knowledge, without, you know, also a certain, you know, involvement in the, 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 the economic growth and the, the business works. So this will fail in so far to have sustainable results in such a process, whether it will be um, a, a framework for these principles or whether it will be just a practical policy. So you have to have this combination of the various partners. So, and this is also not anymore um, a relationship where the other is the enemy, the other is the partner. So, and, 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 and this uh, is a very complicated process so that we have to understand we live in one world and we need each other in a certain way. And uh, this is um, uh, what I say probably more of a cultural uh, issue and not only a poorly political uh, issue or uh, uh, another issue. So that means it needs a better understanding of the challenges of a very globalized world where all are just one click away and we, we have to learn to live together in a new way. Probably it's not coexistence, it's something like cohabitation probably. This is a, a, a better description of this. Thank you. Some time ago you coined the term uh, multiplayer, multi-layer dialogue. Mechanism. M3. Mechanism. M3. Um, Max, you have a question? Hello, good evening. My name is Max Senges. I work in the, um, Google's policy team here in Berlin, but I asked my question as an uh, <laughs> expert in the collab. <laughs> so I was quite intrigued by um, your comment, Ricke, um, that you don't like um, self-regulation, especially um, when it comes to regulating the um, uh, conduct of uh, third point, of users, basically. Um, I was wondering how you uh, think about the idea that user-generated um, content needs user-generated governance. 
and whether that is a solution that would work better, or is that basically leading to um, yeah, lynch and, and uh, all kinds of unreasonable and not legitimized uh, behaviors also, because that's a discussion online mediation and things where users and super users and administrators get involved. Yeah, it's a really good and, and, and difficult question. I mean, we've had the discussion on, um, on Facebook, for instance, in Denmark and their practices. Um, so they've, there have been several privacy cases raised uh, via the, the Irish Data Protection uh, Agency. So um, some people would say, well, Facebook is a private and free service. If you don't like them, go somewhere else. Uh, where a new argument have started to come in um, increasingly that goes like this. Well, Facebook is de facto has monopoly of a social infrastructure. And as such, uh, we cannot only see that they have a certain liberty uh, of, a private, of a private company in terms of defining in their service contract how they for instance, want conversations to take place or which kind of decency standards they want to apply. But, but if, we, if we accept that they are a, a social infrastructure that people are almost dependent upon, uh, this was based on some, some uh, research on, on youth practices in the US where a lot of uh, youth argued that they couldn't just decide not to be on Facebook, but that because that would be the same as to commit social suicide, to walk around with a sack on your head, to have no identity anymore in the campus. So leaving Facebook was not a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pr pretty interesting because that, that addresses that issue of can you then say that, okay, it's a de facto social infrastructure and as such, um, they should adhere with... Um, with freedom of expression standards that we would expect in a public space, meaning that only content that is illegal under national law can be removed, but we accept no further um, scrinkage, so to say, uh, in the Facebook space than defined by that. Uh, that would be, would be rather um, radical, but that's what some people have started to, uh, to propose. Yeah. Uh, before we go to the gentleman in the back, I have a small question to you, uh, Mr. Fleischer. Uh, when we talk about civil society, um, I understand that um, you know, in states such as Germany, in Austria, and Denmark, civil society and governments do interact. But in your experience with other governments, what do you think, Mr. Fleischer? Um, do you also feel that other governments think that civil society uh, should play such a role? I mean, I just recall. Some time ago uh, in Geneva, there was a meeting of states' representatives, and the NGOs were in the room before, and then they had to leave, and one stayed on. And the French representative said, We cannot start yet. Il y a an ONG dans la chambre. <laughs> so th he said, We can't start yet. There is an NGO in the room. Is that a problem? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not quite sure what your question <laughs> aims at and what you expect me to say. Um, it's, I, we definitely uh, uh, agree with uh, Professor Kleinwächter and, and, and the necessity of, of a multi-stakeholder approach and everything else would be just unrealistic, seeing the reality, how the internet is working and how the discourse between government's uh, private sector and civil society is taking place and, and we do appreciate the co contribution but on the other hand um, yes sometimes it makes sense to have uh, meetings uh, for governments only I mean the London uh, cyber conference was a great job by the British colleagues and we had all la layers of stakeholders represented there we discussed all uh, baskets of issues so to speak but there was also a government only meeting on on confidence building measures in in cyberspace and we wouldn't have really have had a problem but it makes it easier for for, for some to, to to talk business so i think um, um but of course <laughs> obviously I, I i tell you uh, obvious things that not all governments have the same openness towards uh, civil society and we are, so i'm really looking forward to the next Internet uh, Governance Forum in, in Azerbaijan, and we will see how, how uh, if unhindered participation of all NGOs will be possible. Okay. Uh, the gentleman in the back has been waiting for some time. Yes. 
I'm Ingolf Pernis uh, from Humboldt University, and I'm one of this bundle of people raising this Institute for Internet and Society here in Berlin. Uh, I was very impressed by all the contributions, and I have learned a lot about uh, human rights now and the Internet. Um, let me ask just two or three little questions. One is to uh, Wolfgang Kleinwächter, who uh, has this great experience in internet governance thinking and developments in this field. Uh, did I understand it right that, or is it wrong? Do the interne internet governance forum and all these groups uh, make rules? I guess I have so far understood no. So the question of legitimacy is of course a different one. If you make rules or quasi legislate, you need another kind of legitimacy as if you are a sort of forum discussing questions, giving opinions on certain things, developing new ideas. So I, I would s believe that that leaves some role of legislation and regulation at the global level uh, to the government, governments if it's needed. So that would just be the question. You are making rules or no make, not making rules? Um, my second thing is um, Mr. Fischer talked, said this nice expression, um, uh, for certain issues we need to talk business <laughs> as governments. And that's an important point because of course it raises some, it's an issue. Can governments talk business only among each other in private? That is the traditional diplomacy. Or is talking about business talking also with those who are concerned, so the stakeholders, um, and including them. Would that be a new kind of governance or government, perhaps, of a more open government in the future? Um, and that brings me to the question of the role of the state. How do we understand the state and its responsibilities today in the word which is including the internet. So we cannot separate internet and the real world, it's part of the real world. So has, what would you feel, Mr. Fischer, has the role of the state and your responsibility as a government changed? Is it something new or is it just the same thing as in the past? And that brings me to the third question, <laughs> to Rick, <laughs> if you allow me. <laughs> to Rike, which is a little bit linked to this, uh, and links Wolfgang and Rike together, um, he said it's not separate, the virtual world. It's part of the new world. And you answer to the question of do we need new human rights or not was no. And I understand your answer so that human rights are something more general. It covers everything. And what we now need is to translate, to construct the existing human rights. So to see what do they mean under the new conditions of internet and all the opportunities which inter the internet gives us, but also the risks for security, for privacy, for protection of property, etc. So what I would like to ask you is, is the set of existing human rights which we have at the international level, also at, in the national constitution, is it sufficient or is there anything, a lacune, where we lack a human right, which we need, which is, you know, 90% is covered of our problems, are there any 10% or 5% or 20% of our human right needs which are not yet covered by the existing mm -hmm. human rights? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, so do, you, do we need new human rights? Do states still matter? 
Does civil society need legitimacy even if it just talks? Um, the Internet Governance Forum has no decision-making capacity. Uh, it was designed as a discussion space where various stakeholders, including decision makers from intergovernmental or non-governmental organizations, come together, exchange their views, go home and make decisions, including setting rules. So this is uh, the, the basic design for the Internet Governance Forum. And this was also the reason why it became a success, because the... Um, to be liberated from the duty to, dis to, to sign something at the end of the day, uh, open mind and mouth, so we had a very free discussion. Part of the free discussion was the question, do we need rules for the internet? And then who would be able to do it? And the last years are a wave of these initiatives. The, uh, Ricke has mentioned the OECD uh, uh, Declaration on Principles on Policy Making in Internet. The Council of Europe has adopted a Declaration on Ten Principles for Internet Governance. The G8 has adopted uh, the principles which in Deauville. Uh, Nelly Cruz has proposed an Internet Compact. Uh, the um, uh, William Hague in London has also six principles. Uh, the uh, Russia and China has proposed, you know, a code of conduct with a number of principles. India and Brazil and South Africa has proposed in the United Nations a set of principles for the Internet. I mean, we, you have, meanwhile, 15 different initiatives which are calling for principles. So that is the reality, also a bottom-up process partly driven by governments only. And the question is now, what do you do with all these initiatives? So, and here the idea now moves forward and the Brazilian government is a driving force now in for the forthcoming IGF in Baku to say, shouldn't we have a session where we'll bring all these initiatives together and think about, you know, what could be the outcome? Um, my argument is, in, uh, I'm involved in this, is if we're just looking for another intergovernmental declaration on principles which would be then signed by the 180 governments, this is no added value. The added value would only come if also other stakeholders commit themselves to what we have already here uh, on paper. And so far, the, there is no need to have new human rights. The human rights declaration is fantastic, but probably it would be good if we have a more a broader commitment, not only by the governments who are part of the, of the uh, con covenant from 1966, but also from other players, because their concrete actions, including private sector corporations, affect the, the, the human rights to a certain way. And we have certain zones where we have unclarity, and there's also different level of protection of human rights in national jurisdictions. So we need a higher level of international collaboration among governments in implementation of human rights. And the Human Rights Council of the United Nations can be strengthened, so probably it's not strong enough just to listen to reports and then to say thank you and then uh, the ambassador of Syria rep uh, reports about freedom of expression in Syria. So uh, here we have a lot of space for improvement and this is could be discussed within the I IGF and then delegate to institutions or create new platforms which will, would then have a mandate from the various stakeholders probably to come up with um, proposal in 2015 or 2020, which would generate all this into something like a framework. I do not speak about a constitution or declaration. A framework of commitments is probably a good title for such a document because commitment means uh, comes bottom up and not top down. It's not, you know, I tell you what you have to do. I commit myself because I'm convinced this is something, you know, which I should do, that you have certain criteria, and then if somebody violates it, then you can go to the institution or to the corporation or to the organization or to the government and say, this is the general acceptance, you know, this is the netiquette we had already for individuals the netiquette in the 19 and 1990s. And what we are talking here is about the netiquette on the global level with all the global players. So this does not contradict what Ricke has said. And we are, I'm in one uh, of the same page with uh, Ricke when it comes to new human rights. There is no need for new human rights. The human rights are good. The human rights are very, very good. That's uh, also one of the outcomes of our initiative. <laughs> I try to be brief. Um, answering the two questions of the professor from Humboldt University. Um, uh, diplomacy with civil society or the diplomats only, we do of course uh, we, uh, do both and uh, even 
sometimes on very sensible issues, uh, or sensitive issues, we, inc we include civil society. We, we held a international cybersecurity conference in uh, December here in the Foreign Office, and we had Russians, Chinese, Americans at the table, military, intelligence, community people, and we were not sending the civil society, civil society representatives out of the room. But the situation was not one like here. It was, I mean, we had all agreed on having no press and no recordings and Chatham House rules. That means that you can uh, say what was said, but not by whom. So um, I think there there is an, 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 a rising level of trust also between governments and civil society uh, uh, representatives. And we, and we of course, need them. Uh, and um, we will do a, a similar approach with an international conference on internet and human rights uh, this autumn where I just learned that we have the pleasure that your institute will be one of our partners. Um, has the role of the state changed with the internet? Well, that's, that's a long issue. Um, it has become more complex uh, or more difficult to define simply because the, the concept of, of sovereignty, of territorial sovereignty is difficult to apply onto cyberspace where the user is here and, 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 and the, uh, the server is there and the service provider is again in the third place. But I would say, uh, pragmatically, uh, we have currently, uh, for, for, for administration of this globe, we have no alternative to the very old-fashioned system of national states and of intergovernmental organizations, regional organizations, global organizations like the UN. Um, one last remark. Uh, we were talking about uh, legitimacy. Uh, we, we should be careful uh, that the United Nations, which have do may very uh, many very beneficial things, but whether they have a legitimacy, the, the, the General Assembly is voting, yes, but more than half of the representatives uh, in the UN General Assembly represent non-democratic government, or which have not been elected. So that... I, I, I mention this because we must always be careful when we discuss internet governance and we think about a stronger role of the United Nations, then we should have this in the back of our minds. Okay, thank you. And you summed up very well on my position <laughs> uh, as an introduction to your question. Um, I can't think of a, an issue that would bear a new human rights, but I can st think of several issues that ne I, I would say need to be elaborated uh, under the existing uh, regime in general comments or, or so. For instance, um, one debate has been on, on access to the internet as a human right. Um, some has proposed that that should be a new right, other has proposed that, that should be, it should be elaborated uh, under freedom of expression. Uh, and I know in the in, in the report of Frank Larue, he stresses that uh, it should be a priority of all states. That's how he formulates it. Maybe that could be strengthened. But I mean, an issue like that. There are also many issues in relation to uh, to privacy that I feel could be elaborated in a general comment. Um, there is no recent general comment on the right to privacy, and given the enormous amount of um, of, uh, of technological development uh, that specifically relates to that right, I would, I would find that very appropriate. Then another issue, um, if we think of some of the big policy issues, uh, policy battles, we have, for instance, the IPR versus creative participation in the public domain sort of battle. I mean, that's a de facto policy battle going on. And if we then look into the, to the human rights standards for guidance on that balance, we don't find a lot. I mean, we find something on, on the protection of creators, not how they should be protected, but that they should be protected, but it's not very elaborated. Uh, and we don't have very much on sort of particip creative participation in the public domain. I mean, there is the... The, the right to participate in the cultural life of the community, but that mostly refer to other issues. Um, so, I mean, there are many issues where you could elaborate on their application um, within specific rights, um, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and adding on to that, Professor Fernisa, um, in our uh, initiative, we had one uh, working group that looked at whether there are any lacunae, any, any gaps in the human rights protection framework, one of our colleagues, Dr. Schumacher, for instance, looked at the question of internet 
access and he concluded that especially for Germany there is a right to internet access but it's already contained in the German uh, in the German national law uh, as developed by the uh, German constitutional court um, there's a question from Manu Scher. hi yeah my name is Manu I'm a global justice fellow at Yale University and one of Google's um, collaboratory experts for this initiative and um, actually these are two small questions the first is uh, we talked a lot about rules and um, formal things um, which is pretty good um, but the my problem is that not in everything but at some points I'm a huge fan of Karl Popper and I love his understanding of democracy saying that the most important thing in a democracy is that um, you are able to get rid of the guys who are ruling you um, without using um, force. Um, now here's the question. Um, if we go one step further, um, how, we make, how do we make sure that the government slash governance systems we come up with um, for the internet, which belongs to all of us, um, how do we make sure that if most people or actors don't like the results of that um, governance slash government system that we can get rid of any commission, any person, any actor who is in charge of that model we are developing right now, right? That's the first question. The second would be um, we had a huge discussion um, and it, this was said um, before by, by, by panelists um, about, about human rights. Um, and one could argue that even if, if they are, you can criticize them very well, the Millennium Development Gold s helped a lot to specify what we understand as implementation of Declaration of Human Rights today. Because we took the charter and we put it into concrete numbers. Um, so how do you think about some kind of internet development goals? How would that specified look like? And if I may, one last sentence. The netiquette for me, in my understanding, um, but I wasn't that active in the 90s though, um, I remember them more as being kind of a knigge and more how to behave to then being some kind of strong legal moral framework, right, on how to use power. So I didn't 100% got that netiquette turns into governance logic, but that might be my misunderstanding. Thanks. Okay. Would you like to perhaps comment on the first part of the question? Okay. Um, I mean, if your question was how, how to get rid of guys like me, I'm not sure I'm the right person <laughs> to give counsel on that. No, no, no. Uh, you would be the one who would help civil society get rid of the other guys. <laughs> Diplomats are here to stay. <laughs> Politicians are here to go. Uh, okay. Um, would you like to comment, perhaps? I think Wolfgang. <laughs> <laughs> Wolfgang is okay. the only one who never yeah. runs out of uh, of answers. Of, answers. <laughs> of questions, no. too. Uh, you know, let me take the netiquette question. So I think the, um, it would be misunderstanding if uh, you believe that I'm in favor of, um, let's say, hard law uh, for the various stakeholders. I think the soft power approach is, is the only realistic approach you can have at least for the next 15 years. And uh, if I compare the situation uh, with uh, the period after World War II, when after the shock of World War II, human rights became an issue in the United Nations. It means human rights was discussed in various places over since the French Revolution, but it was never really discussed as an institutionalized hard law, something like that. And when it was introduced, because the shock of World War II was so big that people said, we have to do now something, we have to protect human rights. Then when some people proposed a treaty with hard law, uh, you know, signed by governments and implemented in, in, in national law, people said, wait a minute, 
we will spend 20 years before this will reach. Can we start with a soft law approach? And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is nothing else as a soft law approach. But um, Roosevelt was very clever to prefer this before going to the international treaty. It needed 18 years until 1966 that you could translate the declaration into legally binding convention. And another 20 years until you have reached 180 or something ratifications by the governments. And in so far now to come with a proposal for a hard law instrument in uh, uh, cyberspace would make nonsense. But to say, okay, we need some soft power approach like the netiquette, now not only for individuals, but for institutions and for governments, could be a realistic approach, not for the next two years, but for a period between 2015 and 2020. So this is just one proposal on the table. If you have a better proposal, which would also accommodate all the wishes from the various players who want to have something or want to avoid something, but to bring them into a certain framework of behavior in good faith in cyberspace, because there is a lot of behavior in bad faith. And we cannot tolerate this behavior in bad faith. We have to do something. And so we have to criteria. We need criteria where we can say, this is good behavior, this is bad behavior. Uh, and, and I think this is really a challenge. We cannot say, you know, just no regulation is the best thing. Freedom, get rid of all these institutions. So certainly this is fine. But if you remember when the French wanted to get rid of the king uh, and say, killed him, 10 years later, they had Napoleon I. So, it was <laughs> not so easy <laughs> if you get rid of somebody that not a little bit later somebody else will rule you. And also the Americans found out in Iraq that uh, it's better to have a second plan, you know, a plan for the aftermath. Um, was there one part of your question that we didn't quite answer? Uh, there were. Uh, could you just uh, reiterate the second part of your question? All right, thanks. Um, yeah, the second question was if, if something like an in, like internet development goals would right. be helpful to specify, Thank you. quantify. Thanks. Uh, perhaps you would like to give us your appreciation on that? <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't actually what I was going to say something on. Um, internet development goals, uh, in a way you could say that the visas attempted a little bit to do that, but they were not very concrete. The World Summit on the Information Society process uh, actually tried to make um, action, thematic action plans and, and a whole bunch of follow-up mechanisms. Um, but I think what is, what is good about the Millennium Development Goal is probably their simplicity. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's the right, if it's the right way to, um, to spend resources um, with regard to the internet at this state. But I was, what I was going to, to, to um, comment on earlier was another part of your question where you asked, uh, how do we secure that we can get rid of these, uh, this new sort of governance, government mechanism if the majority don't like them? And that, that uh, reminded me of something that I think I've discussed with, with Wolfgang also on previous occasions, that I think the problem that I might have with the multi-stakeholder approach, not, not multi-stakeholderism as a consultant, consultancy uh, debating approach. Of course, no one can oppose that, but when we move into that this is the governing mechanism, um, the problem I have is that I think that it, it, it ignores the power aspect, uh, or it seems to, to downplay the power aspect. And coming from the human rights world, I mean, human rights is really about empowering uh, the less uh, the, the the less powerful against the state that has the more power, and 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 the whole setup is mechanisms to to give give the individual those rights and to to um, install mechanisms whereby other states may enforce power on on a state that is misusing its power against the individual. And I know there are tons of faults in the systems, and and it's not working well. But still, I mean. We're still working on, on, on concrete duty bearers, the states, uh, and certain mechanisms whereby they can be removed or the international community can intervene. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm just, I haven't seen the, um, the proposal where I'm really convinced that a new multi-stakeholder sort of governance form where civil society, governments, private companies rule <laughs> the world mm -hmm. side by side, uh, take into account these sort of hardcore power themes. Mm -hmm. 
Well, here's a topic for your habilitation thesis. Um, I'm actually glad for the next question that I have that we are uh, speaking in English. Have you noticed in English that some words are always capitalized, that they are written with a capital letter, such as God or He when referring to God or certain states, or the word states in international law? But there's another word which is always capitalized, and that is internet. Internet is capitalized. Have you thought about that? In English, in the word internet is almost, almost, I've been reading so many texts, I'm sure it is. I've been read. I can promise you, in legal literature, internet is always capitalized. Um, there has been some exception. One exception was your presentation. Uh, it's not capitalized <laughs> in my Okay. The um, International Telecommunications Union some time ago also suggested using small letter I. This provoked a huge uproar in the national community because people said they will be treating it like a normal technology. It is not a normal technology. It's not like the telephone. It's something new. So what do you think? Is the internet something so special that it needs to be protected or is it just another facilitating technology that can be written with a lowercase I? I don't know, language authority, whatever. <laughs> and they said that uh, we, we don't capitalize it anymore. They do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will provide you in my thesis, which, uh, by, <laughs> by the way, which I also handed in one week ago, it is capitalized. <laughs> uh, you asked a question whether there is a difference between um, telecommunication and the internet. And I think we have to be very careful that uh, we have to understand the differences between broadcasting, telecommunication and the internet. All communication systems which were invented in the 19th and 20th century were organized as hierarchies. You had a central point, you know, uh, the, was the telecom uh, operator or it was the uh, sender, the t transmission and broadcasting. But the internet is not hierarchically organized. It's a network of networks which are linked uh, together via protocols and all these are independent networks. That means if you try to bring the internet under telecommunication regulation, then you would try to bring a network into a hierarchical organized uh, regulatory system. And this would risk also that you, know, uh, you take all the dynamism and the, in the, the uh, innovation and the creativity out of the process because these are centralized and uh, um, organizations you know, which have a central switch. And in all revolutions, the first thing the revolutionaries are doing, they go into the broadcasting station and they go into the telecom station to get the communication under control. But you know, the, the, <laughs> the point in Egypt was because all the four ISPs were in one building, so it was easy to capture this, if they would have a distributed system with 100 ISPs across the country and outside, it would have been very difficult to get it with one cut. Uh, the internet out. And this is the difference and this is the risk also for other negotiations among governments now with the ITU in December in Dubai and others that there are governments which would prefer to bring the internet under the regulatory system of telecommunication and this will create a lot of tensions and in so far also you know to try to bring something new to the table in the United Nations is also one way to counter these activities which are going on with the support of a lot of governments and as you have said 50% of the governments in the United Nations have also some uh, legitimacy problems and not everybody in the world has the good luck to have a Danish government or a German government or an Austrian government. Thank you so much. Um, that it's a luck to have an Austrian government uh, is open to debate. <laughs> Especially when ACTA was uh, signed, evidently nobody in no ministry knew why they signed it. Um, that was a fantastic uh, last uh, word, perhaps some last words also from the two speakers to my side. Think about the following, um, not only did I, oh I'm, I'm, do I'm doing self-promotion again, not only did I finish my PhD, I also uh, produced a little daughter six weeks ago. Um, you know, if there's one thing that you would like to tell her, you know, uh, how uh, the internet, uh, if there's one big thing that we should take care about today to ensure a safer, more secure internet tomorrow? What would that one big thing be? One uh, or two sentences? Uh, 
as a little uh, goodbye message, perhaps? Well, I think that um, raising awareness among youth um, on these issues is really important. I mean, every time I'm I'm teaching or I'm I'm involving with the with the I don't know the educational system in in Denmark or internationally. I'm really I'm really making an effort to raise these issues because I mean, that's the that's the future generation, and these issues are important. And I found that people people find that they are they are really interested in these issues and are interested in debating them. It's just that they haven't been that high on their radar uh, yet. For some reason, it seems like it's been from a certain age and up that we've been debating these <laughs> issues. Okay, thank you so much. I'm not sure what advice I would give. Um, although normally I'm, I do not run out of advices that I give to my two sons. Um, I'm not. I'm. Uh, instead, I I would like to report one thing from uh, from the London Cyber Conference. They had a youth congress in parallel, running to this uh, main conference where they had government representatives and companies and NGOs. And, and you know what was the main conclusion of the London Cyber Youth Forum? London rocks? <laughs> no, they didn't understand why we old guys and girls were discussing about cyber. For them, it was just a part of normal part of their world. Thank you so much. So it's part of our world now. Some last wisdom from you? No last wisdom. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, um, Dear audience, uh, members, dear members of the panel, thank you so much for uh, uh, your uh, attention, for your inputs. Um, we're now focusing on the outputs, the outputs of our uh, initiative, and they will be substantial. We will publish uh, a book on what we have researched, what we've done, what we've found out. It will also be available online with even more supporting text. We will have uh, blog entries, we will have audiovisual uh, supporting material, we will have an interview with the uh, with the most important uh, UN representative on um, the freedom of expression, Frank LaRue. And uh, it is with his, his words that I would like to end uh, this uh, presentation of the fifth uh, initiative on human rights and the internet. Frank LaRue said that whatever the states may do to curtail our freedoms online, it doesn't actually matter because the internet will win. And I can assure you, if the internet wins, and we ensure human rights protection on the internet, then we all win. And I tell you that, yes, we can. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a wonderful evening.